Welcome back to The Emily Show. I know I still sound a little froggy just from being, you know, at VidCon and covering nine weeks of trial and getting ready to cover of the Baldwin trial. We're going to talk about all of it today. The Karen Reed hung jury, what's coming up in the Baldwin trial, plus huge updates in the YSL Young Thug Rico trial out of Georgia, and some quick updates in the Brian Koberger prosecution in Idaho. So today is a very updatey type of Emily show, and then we're jumping back into trial coverage. So let's go. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. It's summertime, and there's nothing I love more than a farmer's market. But sometimes, to get the best goods, you got to get up really early, which is not my vibe in the summertime, honestly, or anytime, which is what I love about Green Chef. It brings the farmer's market directly to your door. Green Chef is the first certified organic meal kit company, and they bring you fresh, seasonal, organic produce in every single box. Plus, the instructions are easy to follow, and you can do that through their app or on the cards that come with each meal, you get to select from over 80 weekly menu items to fit any eating lifestyle from keto and paleo to vegan or vegetarian to simply balanced meals. So if you're ready to just let the food come directly to your door, it's time to check out Green Chef. Go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker50 for 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months at greenchef.com slash emilybaker50 and use code emilybaker50. Find out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Let's get back to today's episode. First, let's talk about the Karen Reed trial. Last week, the jury came back undecided. They were hopelessly deadlocked and the court declared a mistrial, which is what you do. The jury sent out three notes saying that they were undecided, that some found that the evidence was proven by the Commonwealth beyond a reasonable doubt and others finding that that burden had not been met and there was no way for them to come to an agreement without compromising their deeply held beliefs on this case, which is when you have that language of beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty, it kind of invites that response from the jurors saying, no, we all have a moral certainty. We just don't all have the same certainty. We don't know what that jury split was. The judge did not poll the jury publicly, which surprised me. I don't know if we will ever know what the jury split was. I hope that the lawyers do. But immediately after that, the defense attorneys for Karen Reed took to the courthouse steps as they have in the past and said that they will continue to fight for Karen Reed, that they have no quit, that they are going to continue to fight this case. And then the Norfolk County DA's office put out a written statement to media outlets saying that they will continue to prosecute the case. The press release from elected DA Michael Morrissey reads, quote, a mistrial has been declared in the matter of the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Judge Beverly Canone set a status conference for July 22nd, 2024 in the Norfolk Superior Court. First, we thank the O'Keefe family for their commitment and dedication to this long process. They maintained sight of the true core of this case to find justice for John O'Keefe. The Commonwealth intends to retry the case. And that came shortly before a statement from state police regarding Trooper Proctor. The statement put out to the media by state police is this, quote, following the mistrial in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, the Massachusetts State Police would like to offer our condolences again to the family of Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe. We cannot imagine the way in which this result has heightened the O'Keefe family's immeasurable grief, heartache, and sense of loss. John lived a life of honorable service both to the city of Boston and the children entrusted to his care after the unexpected death of his sister and brother-in-law. We will remember him. Upon learning today's result, the department took immediate action to relieve Trooper Michael Proctor of duty and formally transfer him out of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office State Police Detectives Unit 
This follows our previous decision to open an internal affairs investigation after information about serious misconduct emerged in testimony at the trial. This investigation is ongoing. Our focus remains on delivering the highest level of police services with professionalism and integrity. What does this mean with regard to Trooper Proctor? Well, it sounds to me like the IA investigation didn't begin until, quote, information about serious misconduct emerged in testimony at trial. I was under the impression from conversation, and again, this is why I don't speculate on things until we know what's happening in trial, but there was lots of talk about whether or not there was already an ongoing IA investigation, which is internal affairs for state police, not the broader investigation that we know is going on with the feds that I will look more into now that we have at least a non-result knowing this will go to trial again. But it seems that state police didn't even open an IA investigation until the trial testimony, which is wild to me. Those investigations take some time and can result in termination and other sanctions. What this sounds like to me is an administrative transfer. When they say relieved of duty and transferred, it seems that he has been put on an administrative desk or task where he's not investigating, his name is not assigned to anything, and this is the steps that are happening before the investigation is complete and they determine whether or not he will be terminated. I won't be surprised if that is the result of the internal affairs investigation. We will see what happens, but this is going to be difficult when the prosecution immediately announces that they are retrying the case. And then on the heels of that, you get their lead investigator being administratively transferred out of a position where he is in charge of anything and an ongoing IA investigation that may result in more strict sanctions. It's going to look even worse for the prosecution upon a second trial. So do I expect that at the end of this, we will see Trooper Proctor being terminated? Yes, I expect that's what we will see. Does that take time and process? Yes, it does. Why? Because lawyers. There are lawsuits. These are government jobs. There is a process that happens before any such termination can happen. Again, the most surprising thing to me is that this investigation from internal affairs wasn't happening before. These texts were known. The state police would have been aware of what was being turned up. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. But right after that, we got a statement from Alan Jackson regarding Trooper Proctor saying, regarding Trooper Michael Proctor being relieved of duty, conduct has consequences. DA Morrissey backed this misogynist corrupt cop. And two hours after he announced he will pursue a second trial against an innocent woman, Karen Reed, the Massachusetts State Police announced that Michael Proctor, the lead investigator for the Commonwealth, has been relieved of duty because of, quote, serious misconduct that emerged in testimony at trial. We look forward to another opportunity to reveal the truth about this unjust prosecution. Good luck. And that is the statement from Alan Jackson. So we know that this case is not going to dial down as it moves forward. In fact, I imagine things will ramp up. My hope is that the jurors who seemed to be incredibly conscientious in going forward with this case are left out of all of it. We know this case has been busy on social media. We know this case has been deeply, deeply divisive locally. And I hope that some of that calms down because there is going to be another trial here. And hopefully we will get some answers. I was hoping this trial would provide some answers as to what happened to John O'Keefe. For me, I was left with more questions than answers. And that's a deeply frustrating place to be because if there are that many questions, why is there a prosecution? But some of the jurors found that the state had proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And ultimately the jurors are the finders of fact. So if there are conflicting facts, the jurors get to decide what they believe. That is their job. We will see what happens as this goes forward. Again, there's a status conference at the end of July. I will do my best to cover it, but it all depends on Alec Baldwin. So let's talk about Baldwin for a moment. The jury selection in the Alec Baldwin trial starts July 9th. There is a fleet of new motions pending before then. It is 4th of July week and your girl needs a minute. So will I be covering all of it? No. Will I summarize it as we begin trial coverage? Yes. Do I think that's best? Yes. 
If it's not best, does it matter at this point? Pro no, <laughs> that's all we've got. But we had been waiting to see what the judge was going to do with the Hannah Gutierrez Reed immunity. The judge denied the state's motion on that. So Hannah Gutierrez cannot be forced to testify by the state. Baldwin had two pending motions to dismiss on two different matters. I said it was unlikely those would get granted and the court did deny those after hearings with the attorneys. The attorneys have not uh, tamped back their displeasure for one another. So it's gonna be real interesting to see how feisty they get during trial. I'm very much looking forward to the opening arguments and seeing some of the same witnesses we saw before, but some different witnesses. Remember, this case is going to focus on Baldwin. I think the state would do well to focus on Baldwin's handling of the weapon and the rushing on set. Is he responsible for why the bullet ended up in the gun because he wasn't giving the armorer enough time? Is he responsible for the negligent handling of a firearm by pointing it directly at Helena Hutchins? Or as an actor, is he just doing what he is told? Or is he going outside of safety measures? And I think we'll see the prosecution focusing a lot on those safety measures, including him continuing to fire blanks after cut is called by Joel Souza, his demeanor on set. And I think we'll see a lot more of that. We're gonna see video of his police interviews video of his George Stephanopoulos interview. So we again will see lots of statements by Alec Baldwin in this trial. And Hannah Gutierrez was really the state's best witness against Hannah Gutierrez. Will it be the same for Baldwin? And the big question I think on everyone's mind, will Alec Baldwin testify? And trust me, if he does, the swiftness with which I will be sending you an alert in the Law Nerd app, unmatched, unmatched swiftness in the law, I immediately yes. So will the defense call Baldwin to testify? We will see. But that trial is going to get underway with jury selection July 9th. That jury selection might take a little longer than Hannah Gutierrez's jury selection just because of the high profile nature of Alec Baldwin and sometimes the strong feelings about him. But I hope that we will get underway July 10th or 11th for opening statements and I will be covering that gavel to gavel. Speaking of gavel to gavel, I said that I would be covering the Brian Koberger trial gavel to gavel, and now we have a trial date. In Idaho, the judge issued a scheduling order while I was covering the Karen Reed trial and has set the trial dates for June 2nd, 2025 through August 29th, 2025. Have I told Dr. B yet that, that the summer of 2025 doesn't seem like it's going to be a summer? No, no, I haven't. I haven't told him yet. Could that date still change? Yes. Were they very much hoping for a summer date in this case? Yes. All the attorneys were hoping for a summer date for trial. But the defense change of venue motion is going to be heard August 29th, 2024. I'll be covering that as well. It might conflict with some of the Corey Richens coverage, but we'll see. And with that change of venue motion on August 29th, 2024, we will get a better sense for where well, the judge isn't going to rule immediately, but where this trial will be and then if there's courtroom availability. So this trial date could still move. There's a long way to go before we get there, but at least there is a date on the books in the Koberger prosecution. But that's the entire summer of 2025. Yes, it certainly is. And speaking of a trial that took forever, the Young Thug trial has quite a lot going on and we need to talk about that. Sometimes you just need to try something new. And with today's sponsor, Thrive, I am rocking a much bolder lip than I would ever normally try because their new Empower Matte Lip Crayon makes it easy. This is one of the reasons I love working with Thrive is everything in their cosmetics line is vegan and cruelty-free. And they have the Thrive Giving Promise where they give back a portion of each purchase to their giving partners, but they also make it simple. And the Empower Matte Precision Lipstick Crayon is really just that. When I talk about wanting all of my makeup to be crayons, this is exactly what I mean. So this two-in-one lipstick and liner allows you to do everything, line, define, and fill in just a few swipes. And it's waterproof and sweatproof and lasts for up to 12 hours. So you're not going to outwork this lip that is working. Right now, you can get an exclusive 10% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash lawnard. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash lawnard for 10% off your first order. Let's get back to today's episode. 
You may remember the last time I covered the Young Thug YSL RICO trial out of Georgia. We talked about what was going on with the judge and this ex parte, which is a in-chambers closed-door meeting that the defense attorneys weren't a part of. One of the witnesses, Witness Copeland, was in chambers with the judge, the DA, his own attorney, and others. The attorney, Brian Steele, who is the attorney for Young Thug, which is his stage name. Jeffrey Williams is his given name, but we're going to go with stage name. It's the Young Thug trial. That is how we know him. His attorney, Brian Steele, brought it to the court's attention that he was aware of this ex parte hearing. The judge then says, basically, name him. How do you know who told you? Brian Steele wouldn't state that on the record or at all, saying that it was part of his work product and representing his client and that he wasn't going to disclose it at all. The judge held him in immediate contempt of court and had the bailiffs take him into custody and sentenced him to 20 days in custody to be served on the weekends during this murder trial. Remember, it took 11 months, 11 months to pick a jury in this case. Jury selection started in January 2023 and went through November 2023. And then this trial started in December 2023. It's July 2024, and this trial is now indefinitely on hold. And there have been breaks before. There have been issues with other defense attorneys. There was a medical issue with one of the defendants who was attacked in custody and needed to recover. There have been huge pauses in this trial. I don't know how this jury is doing this, but this jury is still the jury in the case, even though testimony has been indefinitely paused. Here's why. Defense attorney Brian Steele filed a whole bunch of motions, some to the Georgia Supreme Court, appellate court, and then at the state level court. The Supreme Court gave him a stay, essentially, of having to serve his custody sentence and uh, issued a bond so he doesn't have to go into custody until this entire issue is resolved. The appellate court essentially said, you need to make motions in the lower court to have the judge recuse himself, and then you can appeal the rulings on that. And that's exactly what was done, and I covered that briefly, the motions from Attorney Steele saying, look, Judge Glanville, you can't do this anymore. You are conflicted on this case. There is bias here, and you need to recuse yourself. What happens if this trial judge recuses himself? I think at this point, it has to be a mistrial. And I don't say that lightly. This case has been extensive. We're, what, 18 months plus into this case? A mistrial at this point is a huge waste of time and resources. But when we're looking at the witness, Copeland, who had the ex parte hearing, that witness continued to testify after that ex parte, even after defense raised issues about it. And I don't know if you can unring that bell. Even if that witness is brought back to the stand to be cross-examined with what the defense attorneys now know, I don't know if that fixes it. And I don't think there's any way around this case being a mistrial having to go again, which is there are seven defendants here. There are over 26 or 27 defendants total in this RICO charge. There are multiple prosecutions stacked behind each other in this case. So a mistrial here would be devastating, but the defendants have inalienable constitutional rights. And if those rights are violated, there's no other remedy for them. You can't just keep going forward when they're asking for the judge to be recused in a mistrial. There's no other way around it. So the judge made a bit of an about face on Monday, July 1st, the same day that the Karen Reed jury ended up coming back as deadlocked. And on Monday, the judge indicated that he is going to actually send the motions for recusal to another judge to determine, which is the proper thing to happen here. Another judge should have also heard the contempt proceedings, but that ship has kind of sailed. The motions to disqualify this judge or to have this judge recused need to be heard, and they are going to be heard by another judge. That's the proper result. And the judge released the entire transcript to the defense, and now it is public because it's court record, of the hearing in chambers. Did I think it was going to be worse than what we'd heard? No. Is it? Yes. So this hearing took place with quite a few people in chambers and took place in chambers before the witness even came in. So the hearing started with the judge, assistant DA Love, attorney Bumpus, the court reporter, and two investigators for the DA's office. 
And at the beginning of that, the DA went through what they were concerned about and the testimony of Mr. Copeland and giving Mr. Copeland immunity and talked about the fact that initially when the DA was emailing back and forth with Copeland's attorney, Copeland's attorney forwarded along to other defense attorneys, Steele and another defense attorney who are representing defendants in the Young Thug case. So the defense attorney for witness Copeland is sharing the conversation between themselves and the DA with other defense attorneys on the case. And that very much pissed off the DA in this case. Before they even bring Copeland in, the DA is telling the judge about this issue. And the DA said in this hearing, whose interest are you protecting? And this is the DA responding to Copeland's attorney. The DA responded to that email saying, whose interest are you protecting? Yours or Mr. Steele's? Whose clients, which client are you protecting? Whose client, yours or Mr. Steele's? He wrote back and said, quote, you are going to get him killed. This is Copeland's attorney talking about Copeland. You have made him, you are making him a target, fuck you. So there's no love lost between Copeland's attorney and the DA, because the DA is forcing Copeland to testify and giving him immunity. And his defense attorney is saying he's not going to testify. And in fact, when Copeland took the stand, he said, I'm not a snitch and tried to plead the fifth, even though they had granted him immunity to overcome that. He's like, I'm not saying anything, which in a case with gang allegations, isn't a shock and shouldn't be a surprise to the DA that this witness doesn't want to testify. So this context, when the witness then comes into chambers and says, fine, I'll just lie. I'll go on the stand and lie. I'll take responsibility. I'll say I killed people. I'll just say it was me. You're going to give me immunity? I'll just say it was me. The defense needs to know that. If a witness is telling the judge and the DA, if you put me on the stand, I'm going to lie. And if I lie, I'm going to take responsibility for everything because you already gave me immunity. So I'll just take responsibility for all the stuff. You gave me immunity and whatever. Or I'll take the fifth and you can't force me to testify or I'll just sit in jail. And then when Copeland came in to talk to them, he said, fuck you guys. You know what you're doing. You know it's my kid's birthday coming up. But if you want to put me in custody, fuck you. Put me in custody. I don't care. I'm not saying shit. And it goes on and on and on. This is a much longer ex parte than I anticipated it being. And they didn't just talk about scheduling. They didn't just talk about the witness being afraid. Having a conversation about the witness being afraid and needing protective custody and how that practically would work wouldn't be the most inappropriate ex parte. There are ways that if you don't talk about the case and say, this is how we're protecting you, this is what that use of immunity or grant of immunity encompasses. Your attorney can talk to you about it when we're out of the room. This is how we're going to offer you protection. What are you afraid of? Those conversations without talking about the substance of the case, the substance of the testimony may be okay in some circumstances. But talking about what you're going to testify to or not testify to, talking about the substance of the case, talking about the facts of the case, none of that is appropriate for an ex parte communication. And what the DA is offered or promised is all stuff that has to be disclosed to the defense because they can cross-examine this witness on it. He gets up and testifies, and they're like, you told the DAs you were going to lie, didn't you? Yeah. And they still put you on the stand. Yeah. Did you lie? Yeah. Like the defense needs to know that so they can cross-examine this witness. Again, the DA should know this, but the judge also knows this. This is not a proper conversation to be had ex parte. The conversation about fear and safety, sure. But once we get into the nature of the testimony, there's no way that that should have been ex parte. And there's no way that when it was brought to the court's attention, the judge's response should have been, who told you? This transcript should have been made available. This ex parte never should have happened. And I think that when another judge looks at this, they're going to recuse the judge. In part of this hearing, the judge is telling the attorney what the attorney needs to say to their client. The court says, quote, and I think part of his challenge, Ms. Bumpus, Copeland's attorney, maybe that you need to assure him, quote, look, I'm going to be here. And if you think that they are asking you a question, end quote, they being the state or the defense, quote, is asking a question that's going to bring out other crimes that you're going to, he's going to be able to look at you and say, can I have a chance to talk with you? And the DA said, that's exactly right. So now they're telling the attorney what to tell the client. And then the DA says, that's exactly right. And the defense attorney goes, uh-uh. And the DA says, see, but that's just it. 
And the defense attorney says, no, he's not. And the DA says, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's just it, Judge. The problem is that there's been an assertion that people are representing, and I'm not talking about you, and the defense attorney says, yeah. And the DA goes on to say, there's been an assertion that people are representing his, that their biggest concern is his best interest, and then they're just not here. And Ms. Bumpus is saying she's not in a position to do that. Bumpus is not Copeland's regular attorney. Copeland's regular attorney is on vacation the week that this is all going down. And he's supposed to be granted immunity and protection and testify and be forced to testify or stay in jail for years. And when they told him he would stay in jail for years, they said for years until all the prosecutions are done. And Bumpus goes on to say, no, I'm not saying I'm not in a position. I'm saying that the agreement between Mr. Copeland and the other attorney who I'm standing in for is that if he chooses to testify, I'm to get him to sign this paper that says that then discharges the other attorney as his rep. That's their agreement. I can't do nothing about that. And so now there's this whole other issue going on about whether or not this witness Copeland is also changing lawyers in the midst of this agreement for immunity. And the DA is like, what are you even talking about? But all of this gets into talking about this witness's testimony. So when we're looking at what's going to happen next, another judge is going to hear the motions to disqualify and to recuse Judge Glanville. If that happens, that motion also asks for a mistrial. And I can't imagine if they're removing the judge after 18 months, after this ex-party conversation happened and after this witness continued to testify, that anything happens other than a mistrial. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on this even as we get underway in Baldwin. But for now, the Young Thug trial is on pause. And will it be taken off pause like a housewife hoping to get onto traitors? I don't know. I don't see any other way around this, and I will be very interested in how the courts handle it. But it seems that even if the courts don't declare a mistrial and there is a conviction at the end of this trial, that the issues for appeal are so hopelessly stacked up that this case really won't actually have a conviction of anything because on appeal, all of this will be rehashed again and I truly don't see a way around it. But I'm not an appellate judge, so we will see. That ex parte is a huge problem. And allowing that witness to continue testifying while the issue of the defense attorney for young thugs contempt is still standing is a problem. Hopefully that all made sense. I'm baffled by what has happened in the young thug trial. Truly and honestly baffled and a bit horrified. This never should have happened. And the defense attorney who disclosed it to Young Thug's attorneys and others, I think was doing ethically what they thought was right because they knew that this ex parte never should have happened this way either. And it seems that that's exactly how this was disclosed because the judge in his hearing on Monday said that he had seen footage from the courthouse hallway where this attorney is talking to attorney steals. So the judge knew exactly how all this went down. And I think was mad that anyone would dare talk about what happened in chambers. But when what happens in chambers is wrong, it should be discussed and it should be brought to light. And we will see what another judge thinks of all of this. I hope it gets sent to a different courthouse. Judge Glanville is the site judge of his courthouse. And we will see how all of this goes. So hopefully the recap today was helpful. Thank you to our sponsors for keeping us supported even when The Emily Show is quick. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Shopify, who not only sponsors, but also hosts The Law Nerd Shop. I started working with Shopify the second I knew I was going to need a merch shop because, well, The Law Nerds asked for merch and Shopify makes it that easy that I could build it myself in the middle of the night while on the phone with a friend. What I didn't know I would need so much is for my online e-commerce platform to make international shopping easy because the law nerds are such an international crew. When I say it's easy, Shopify really is. And their award-winning helping customer service is there to help you as your business grows at every stage. 
whether that's just launching your shop or moving past a million orders. And Shopify is with you, whether you're selling online or at your local farmer's market or both or anything in between. And they have the internet's best converting checkout, so you're not wasting your time in a shop that is confusing for your customers or community. It's no wonder that Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., from Brooklinen and Allbirds to the Lawnard Shop and your favorite nail polish. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash lawnard. Remember, that's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash lawnard now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. And start hearing this sound soon. Let's get back to today's episode. So with all of that, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a lawnard. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. May the odds be ever in your favor, and may you be ready for another gavel-to-gavel -gavel trial. Don't forget to get the Lawnard app, and I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnardapp.com, or search your app store for Lawnard. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Lawnard.